My name is Antoine van Akma. I'm one of the trustees of Brookings, and it's my great honor and, and privilege to introduce uh, Daniel Doctoroff, former deputy mayor for economic development, the man who made it all happen um, in New York, and also former CEO of, of Bloomberg. Uh, and he will have a conversation with our own Bruce Katz later. So it's easy to forget that New York in the early 70s was a really very different place from today. Now, I know because I lived, worked, and got married <laughs> there at that time. Many areas of New York did not feel safe. The once thriving waterfront where millions of immigrants were brought on passenger ships was a shambles. Uh, it had become an ugly wasteland. Uh, you wouldn't got, get uh, caught dead in Brooklyn. <laughs> Tenement houses on the Lower East Side were outdated in disrepair, no longer needed after the garment manufacturing industry basically left. New York then was a city on the way down. There was little construction. It was somewhat disheveled, bleak, losing population, and without a compelling vision of its future. Pessimism, particularly after 9-11, was widespread. Then, although a number of steps, certainly in the area of safety, were taken by earlier administration, that changed dramatically under Mayor Mike Bloomberg. And the man he appointed in charge of this reshaping, reimagining, and rebuilding was Deputy Mayor Dan Doktoroff. Harvard grad, uh, trained as a lawyer, investment banker, and private equity manager. Him and a team of savvy politicos and young whisk kids. The rest is history. And it's told brilliantly in Doktoroff's new book with the telling title, and we'd like the word great these days, Greater Than Ever, New York's Big Comeback. So last week, I was in New York, and on the train back, I read his book. No one is going to deny that New York is a totally different city today. And what's most amazing is that what seemed to be the nadir, September 11, really turned out to be not a dead end, but actually the beginning of something really big. It's actually hard to fathom what the Bloomberg Doctor of Team did. The, the scope and the scale of it are just simply mind-boggling. Not just the celebrated High Line, uh, the new bicycle routes, the parks, the cultural institutions. But the total renaissance of Brooklyn. I was there recently, and my son lives in Brooklyn, and my wife and I came on Saturday night, and Brooklyn, where I would never go. Um, we left Brooklyn on a Saturday night, and we saw the train, the subway train, in the other direction was packed with people. That's the change. Um, the first smoke-free bars and restaurants, the first new subway line, and low-income housing development. New York is now growing, and growth is important, vibrant, safe, and exciting again. In the research for my own book, The Smartest Places on Earth, I already knew that the key to making th cities grow again is to focus on collaboration, a systemic, a systemic approach, strengthening the economic and diversifying the economic base, and last but not least, vibrancy. It sounds like a simple recipe, but to implement and execute it is not easy and makes all the difference. New York has become a great example of how to transform a city. What I like about Dan Doktorov is that he is both a doer and a thinker, both, by the way, on a vast scale. Only with someone who accomplished as much as he did can you add as an afterthought that he's also a terrific writer. I love this book. It could have easily been a very boring book, part memoir, part city planning guide, but instead it's an exciting, timely, 
and most of all, upbeat stories. And God knows we need upbeat these days. It's, I literally found myself sitting at the edge of my seat, racing through the chapters and absorbing the stories he tells. It's also a very personal, very moving document. I mean, this was not a cakewalk. Uh, both Dan's parents and good friends died at crucial moments, and you could feel his suffering. He also discovered quickly that New York politics were rough. At times, Albany and the city were at each other's throats, jockeying for position. One of his allies was literally murdered on the floor of, of, of the city council. Vested interest fought back in Wiley. That's a nice word of saying it, ways. And there was lots of political sniping. No wonder that, uh, as he describes in his book, he never came home before dark and bicycled in his office at 5.30 in the morning. I think only the strict observers of the Sabbath probably helped him avoid a nervous breakdown. <laughs> and how his wife and children cope with that, I sometimes wonder about. It must not be easy. Um, but Dan is resilient. His biggest asset probably that he has in it, as you can read in the book, a, a totally infectious, even boyish enthusiasm that must have done wonders to disarm his opponents and bureaucrats. A great book has wonderful details. Two I just want to share with you. One is Hillary Clinton coaching him before the fateful speech in Singapore on the Olympics to make it more emotional. I thought that was interesting. Um, and I, 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 I really remember the visual image of the flowing robes of the fellow judges at his father's funeral. What I also admire about him is how he managed to transform disaster into success time after time. It began with turning 9-11 from a reason to be despondent to an urgent catalyst and motivating force, but it's best illustrated by what must have been the biggest disappointment of his life. Um, about not getting the Olympics to New York after he had poured his heart into this effort. But it was changed into the key impetus, deadline, and focus for redevelopment. So let me end with picking out just a few quick lessons from this captivating book, particularly for those who are trying to revive cities. And by the way, I forgot and I always follow Ellen's orders, to welcome the webcast audience here as well as you in the room. Um, so, seven quick lessons. First, always aim at maximum collaboration. But know that you're going to get epic political battles and vicious attacks by powerful vested interests. As Dr. Roth puts it in his mild style, Generally, we learned and adapted. I like that. Two, use a clear conceptual framework because otherwise it is impossible to make sense out of complicated and conflicting issues. That starts with asking two essential questions. Is it good for long-term competitiveness? And will it make the city or the neighborhood more vibrant? Three. Start with a big, bold, ambitious vision based on out-of-the-box thinking. Often, starting with a crazy, intuitive, poorly thought-out idea, but then follow it by penetrating unbureaucratic analysis and honest listening to local communities. Next, pick smart people who think analytical, but also have emotional intelligence, who can build relationships and know how to listen. Not easy. Next, fess up when you're wrong. Show a willingness to change your mind and course if needed. Dan did that with manufacturing, for example. I was glad to see that. Six, don't be a whiner or a quitter. Only a consistent pattern of never giving up makes it possible to make lemonade out of lemons. You inevitably have opponents and make enemies, but you should never Hold grudges. I thought that was a very important lesson. And finally, it helps to have Dan's unusual talent to visualize a vision, and as he puts it, spot stories in numbers. So, with that, 
I'm dying to hear Bruce Katz, the man who knows more about the revival of cities and what it takes than anyone in the world, interview Dan Doctorov, today's Robert Moses, the man who actually made it happen in New York. Thank you. That was wonderful. So thank you, Antoine. It's pretty um, much downhill from here. You know. <laughs> um, and we need to post those lessons, actually, <laughs> after the fact. I also want to welcome everyone on the webcasts. Um, as we proceed, send your questions to us uh, via Twitter, uh, hashtag uh, New Localism. And I just want to start easy. Why did you write the book? Well, I had nothing else to do. No, <laughs> I, <laughs> Uh, in fact, that was the problem. Uh, no, you know, it's it's been 10 years since I left City Hall now, and, you know, a lot of what I worked on takes a very long time to bear fruit. You know, you do a development of a major part of the city. You can't evaluate it in the moment. Um, and so I think it's only now kind of apparent what we did well, what we didn't do well, I think the lessons are really important, um, particularly, by the way, at this moment in time. I think ultimately what the book is about, it's an optimistic view of government, that government can be effective, something we need to hear maybe more now than ever. And so it's just sort of a confluence of those things. I, I want to also start by asking you what you brought to the job, because what was really interesting to me, and I did not know this story, is you came in uh, to the deputy mayorship as sort of an Olympics obsessive in a way. I mean, you had already started thinking about New York City getting the Olympics. And I want to ask you, how did that shape 9-11, dot-com bubble, huge economic issues in New York City? How did this prior focus on New York City getting the Olympics shape how you approach the deputy mayorship? Well, in fact, I think the Olympic bid itself, I, I had the crazy idea that New York ought to host the Olympics. And so, you know, it literally occurred to me sitting in the stands at the semifinal match of the World Cup in 1994 and thought that the most international city in the world um, actually should host the most international event. I've been subsequently corrected that the Toronto is the most international <laughs> city, <laughs> city in the world. Right. But, but in any event, um, I had this idea, and it was just a crazy idea, and I started researching it. And the insight that I had was that if done well, the Olympics, or maybe even Olympic bid, could actually be a catalyst for getting things done in a city that had been talked about for decades in some cases. And so the, the idea of hosting the Olympics actually morphed before I was deputy mayor into a plan for the physical future of New York. And that plan actually, in pieces at least, got adopted by Mike Bloomberg when he ran for mayor. He'd been on our board, he'd given some money. <laughs> And then when he became mayor, surprisingly, because it was a total shock, um, he asked me if I'd become his deputy mayor and do a lot of the stuff that um, we had talked about in the bid. Now, we obviously had other imperatives as well. 9-11 intervened. Right. So we had to deal, obviously, with the, the rebuilding of the World Trade Center site. The economy was a disaster. That modified our plans a little bit. But... I actually felt I was extraordinarily well prepared, at least in terms of the substance, maybe not the politics, um, to take the job because I've been thinking about these issues for five years. I think that really comes through in, in the first chapter, actually. I mean, because you came in with a sense of reshaping yeah. the physical geography of, of New York City. Uh, by the way, I mean, the real... My real uh, credibility for interviewing you is I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, um, near Coney Island, when Brooklyn was Brooklyn. Right. Um, so um, my, the message from my mother is thank you. <laughs> um, Does she still live you know, in the same neighborhood? She still lives in the same place. Yep. Uh, so, um, I, so I want to start with your vision of growth, because there's a quote in the book um, which I think we really need to grapple with in this room and really throughout the urban field. 
Uh, to be a progressive city, we must be a prosperous city. And we can't be a prosperous city unless we are a growing city. I want you to talk about your philosophy and Bloomberg's philosophy of growth, the notion of a virtuous cycle, and then how do you deal with the externalities around housing? Yeah. So, um, you know, our view was that this philosophy is what I call the virtuous cycle of the successful city. And as Bruce said, you know, underlying it is the belief that in order to be progressive, you actually have to have to be prosperous. But what do I mean by the virtuous cycle? Uh, you know, the goal of a city, in my view, at least in the developed world, um, is to grow. And the reason for that is it's the best indication that you're doing things well. But on the really what's more important is the marginal revenues from that additional person, job, or um, res resident, job, or visitor are greater than the cost. And therefore, those incremental revenues can be reinvested, hopefully wisely, back in quality of life which helps to attract more people. And so the, the cycle perpetuates itself. Now, that notion of reinvesting in quality of life is really the important thing. What do we mean by that? Making the city safer, providing better education or greater opportunity, paying for affordable housing, for example. Um, and so I don't see an actual contradiction between sort of the calls for greater equity or greater progressivity and this notion of the virtuous cycle. What you have to do, though, in some cases we got this calibration a little bit wrong, is you've got to make sure that you are accommodating that growth effectively. Um, if you don't, if the population, for example, grows too quickly, um, and you haven't provided, for example, with the appropriate supply of housing, housing prices go up, the city becomes less affordable. In the first years of the Bloomberg administration, I think we did that really well. We actually announced um, a, a really dramatic affordable housing program right at, at the end of 2002 when the city was still on its knees financially and emotionally. We doubled down on it in 2006 where the affordability problem really became acute actually was after the financial crisis when the economy took off again, but there wasn't the housing in the pipeline because of the financial crisis. And so now the city is really struggling to catch up. That's why actually I applaud um, Mayor de Blasio's effort to build even more affordable housing than we did. I, I want to stick on the growth theme. I'll come back to the housing piece. but. What struck me also about the book, and this is, again, like Antoine, I'm, I'm sort of focused on principles or strategies we extract, either for other U.S. cities or for global cities. Your focus on the industry profile of the city of New York, not just post 9-11, but, but post the financial crisis of the early part of the century, was to try to diversify the economy off the competitive advantages of the city both sectorally but more generally. Could you talk about that? Because this was really evidence-driven in many respects. Yeah, you know, so when, and remember, you got to remember the context that we faced when we came into City Hall. It was January 1st, 2002. It was three and a half months after 9-11. The city was a disaster financially, let alone emotionally and in lower Manhattan physically. And so... Um, we had to develop a strategy for the city and the city's economy. Uh, right away, what we did was we did a detailed analysis of every industry in the city and looked at those industries. We interviewed executives. We interviewed employees. Um, we tried to get a handle on, in reality, absent subsidies, uh, absent intervention, you know, what could New York actually compete for? We we're a high cost place. That was not going to change. There was basically nothing we felt we could do to fundamentally alter that. We, uh, there was a perception that New York was less safe than in reality it was. On the positive side, New York was viewed as the most open, the most welcoming, 
the city with the greatest energy in the world. In fact, my favorite story, and this really crystallized it for me, was when I was bidding for the Olympics, I'd always ask people, you know, like, what do you think about New York? And I was in Tokyo, and I met with the president of a Japanese bank. And he had worked and run the branches, I think, in Sydney, London, Paris. I don't remember where else. And I said to him, I said, what's your favorite city in the world? He said, New York. And I said, why? And he said, you're going to laugh at me. I said, I promise. I won't laugh at you. And he said um, that it is the only city in the world where I walk, when I walk down the street, people ask me for directions. (laughs) (laughs) And I withheld a chuckle, but it's actually incredibly profound because fundamentally what he was saying was, no matter who you are, no matter what you look like, no matter how you dress, people in New York just naturally assume that you're a New Yorker. And that sense of openness draws people from all over the world. And, you know, I believe ultimately that it's sort of the immigrant um, come, who is at the end of the day an optimist. You know, he has to believe that where they're going is better than where they left. And when you put a bunch of immigrants together in a place, it creates sort of an energy that is palpable. And that's the first right. thing that everybody notices about New York. That was our competitive strength. So we looked at our weaknesses. We looked at our strengths. We did economic analysis of kind of how industries could compete in New York. We decided to cut off right away subsidies for companies staying in the city um, and focus on industries we thought we could compete for and develop strategies for each one that we pursued really aggressively. So tourism, film and television industry, life sciences, um, as well as uh, higher education among them. And that actually turned out to be I think, incredibly successful. Well, going back to your story, now I know why everyone is wandering around New York City lost, because they're they're asking the wrong people for directions. Um, Nobody speaks the same language, but it's classic. Um, And and to to a large extent, the seeds of the current New York City economy, no one ever thought of New York City as a tech hub. They they really were planted when y'all were in office. I want to talk about growth and your approach to land because, you know, one of the greatest powers, at least of American cities, is the power over zoning and land use. And to a large extent, what you did in New York City has now become really the model for other U.S. cities, but also global cities, about thinking about unutilized or underutilized land and rethinking of its purpose in a 21st century economy. You've rezoned essentially about 40% of the city. So could you talk about that? Because what we hear from a lot of U.S. cities, or more even European cities, is we're built out, and this is the way it is. And you've reimagined, partly maybe because of this Olympics bid, how to think about the city anew. Well, so, you know, you have to give you a couple of facts. You know, after World War II... Um, New York had a million manufacturing jobs. By the time we came into City Hall, there were 140,000 or so. Um, The city had not been rezoned since 1961 when there were 800,000 manufacturing jobs in the city. So there were huge swaths of land particularly along the waterfront, but on the west side of Manhattan, near downtown Brooklyn, um, that had basically been left to deteriorate over a 50-plus year period of time. And that was obvious, but nobody wanted to do anything about it. And they didn't want to do anything about it for a number of reasons. One, there was a nostalgia for manufacturing Um, that everybody hoped would return, but was sort of obvious to us that it wasn't going to. By the time we came into office, the single largest manufacturing employer in the city um, was the company that filled sweet and low packages, and they had 400 jobs in the city. We just didn't have the land 
um, and the access that modern in industry actually required. Um, the other thing that happened was, you know, partly as a result of the battles between sort of Robert Moses and Jane Jacobs, the failure over major development projects um, like Westway, which you may be familiar with, was going to create a park down the west side of Manhattan, you know, the destruction of Penn Station, um, some of the stuff that Robert Moses did in terms of destroying neighborhoods for you know, slum clearance and highway construction and some of his housing projects themselves. There was sort of a gun-shy um, attitude in New York about development. And I think on some level it took people who were naive, you know, who weren't burdened by the battles of the past, mm -hmm. you know, who were somewhat more objective about the reality of the present and the potential of the future to tackle some of those problems. As I said, as part of the Olympic bid, what the uh, insight that I had was the Olympics could act as a catalyst for rethinking cities if done well. And we'd spent the time to look at a lot of those places before coming into uh, government um, and so had a plan when we came in for the Brooklyn waterfront for downtown Brooklyn. And in all those cases, you know, all over the city, Harlem, Flushing near LaGuardia Airport, Coney Island, we'd actually cited Olympic, vet, proposed Olympic yeah. venues, and then began to build plans around them, again, using the Olympic spotlight um, as the catalyst to actually getting things done. So we came into government with this agenda right from the very beginning, and, you know, it I think in part enabled us to actually overcome um, a lot of that either inertia or resistance. A couple other things enabled us to overcome it as well. One was 9-11 itself. You know, the title of the book, Greater Than Ever, is echoes what Rudy Giuliani said literally on 9-11, said, you know, New Yorkers are not going to be set back by this. We're going to pull together. We're going to make the city greater than ever. I think he actually said better than ever. But, um, and people rallied around that. Mike Bloomberg echoed it when he became mayor. And so, you know, we also saw 9-11 actually as a catalyst, as Antoine said. I think another thing um, that uh, actually happened um, was that, um, you know, just Rudy Giuliani, um, who, you know, I think people have very mixed feelings about sometimes, um, the fact that crime was reduced um, in New York, um, something that had been perceived as an intractable problem, made people believe again right. that impo the impossible actually could be done. So I think we rode kind of the wave of the Olympic bid, sort of 9-11, and the foundation that had been built about difficult things being possible again to actually do you know, a, a very, very kind of broad set of initiatives. I, I want to stay on the land issue um, because you've also written the foreword to a Brookings book, so you've got to plug it, right? Uh, the Public Wealth of Cities by Dog Detter. And my sense as you look at your various initiatives, including the High Line, is you understood the intrinsic value, what we would call the public wealth of cities, yeah which might lie in assets that the city actually owns or even air rights or other rights that the city could basically deploy. And I wonder if you could talk about, because in a way you were practicing 10, 15 years ago, what we're now describing as a, as a new norm for cities to follow. There, there's money for every city lying all over the place. You right. just have to go find it and yeah. be creative enough. And we found it in the air we found it in future taxes. We found it in the value of the sidewalks and in the value of the streets. Um, and so we were desperate for money when we came in and didn't have any to do a lot of what we wanted to do. So we had to be incredibly creative. The story of the High Line is really instructive. Everybody 
How many people here have actually been on the High Line? Wow. Kind of remarkable, yeah. actually. <laughs> so 8 million people or so last year walked on right. the High Line. When we came into office, um, it was about to be torn down. The Giuliani administration really wanted to tear it down. And they wanted to tear it down in part because the landowners who own property underneath the High Line um, wanted it torn down. They thought it would be much more valuable um, if their land would be more valuable if it was torn down. And so, um, and every single one of them had to agree to keep the High Line up in order to get the railroad that owned the High Line to agree to preserve it. So how do you do that uh, when we didn't have any money at all? The answer was to create money out of air. So how did we actually do this? And this, um, Amanda Burden, uh, who is our uh, planning commissioner and a guy by the name of Vishan Chakrabarty, um, who was the Manhattan Borough Commissioner for City Planning, kind of worked on this scheme. So we said, you know what? We're gonna give to you landowners air rights over your land. We're gonna create them out of nothing. Literally create that right. And then we're gonna rezone the area around the High Line um, so that um, big apartment buildings could get built on the avenues near the High Line. Um, but the only way that the owners of the land on the avenues could actually build up um, was to buy those air rights from the owners of the land under the High Line. And therefore, um, we created a market, basically, in air. And it worked amazingly well, so well, by the way, that the leader of the enemies of the High Line, who wanted it torn down about two years ago, sold the property that he owned and bought for $10 million in the 1970s um, for $875 million. So it worked almost too well. But the reality is we found great ways of creating money. You know, we, we, Hudson Yards, which is adjacent to the High Line, which is America's largest ever development, which is built over rail yards, is only possible because we extended the subway um, into the area, the first subway extension in over a generation. Again, we had no money to pay for it. The evil government in Albany wasn't gonna <laughs> permit it to happen. The city decided to pay for the subway extension itself. The city doesn't control the subway system. The way we paid for it at a time we had no money is we literally created the world's largest tax increment financing district, essentially saying to um, the um, bondholders that you know if we build it, you know people will come, development will occur. That's now happened, and the thing throws off we'll throw off billions of dollars into the city. But again, we had to create money out of nothing. You know, when I come back in my next life, I want to come back as a parking lot owner you know, um, exactly. <laughs> in a reviving city. Um, I think so much of what you're describing uh, are really norms or models of growth, governance, and finance that you basically invented and then applied, which can be adapted to other places, whether they're in the U.S. or not. But since you brought up Albany, uh, which you call, and this is really a nice statement, a complete hall of mirrors, um, I think one of, the, one of your initiatives that did not happen was congestion pricing, uh, which would have helped to finance the recapitalization of the subway and some other things. Talk about the relationships with Albany and how New York State and New York City are structurally built, because New York State is a more interventionist government than, let's say, Oklahoma, Missouri, or even California. So how were you able to get this stuff done when New York State was essentially either owning certain assets within New York City or actively working against you? Um, it was hard. Um, in fact, uh, I, I talk in the book about my formula which is sort of the degree of, I called it Doctoroff's theorem, but it's, um, it's really my second law of government. My first one is anything temporary is permanent. Um, 
But uh, the, the second law is sort of this theorem of the degree of difficulty of actually getting anything done in government. And the formula is x plus 3y plus 10z plus infinity, okay, where x is the number of city agencies involved, y is the number of state agencies involved, z is the number of federal agencies involved, and infinity is if the Port Authority is involved. <laughs> <laughs> and so the point is, is that the degree of difficulty of getting anything done increases asymptotically, basically, <laughs> if you have other levels of government involved. As a result, our approach was essentially wherever possible to avoid the other levels of government. Um, and that was particularly true for the state, which is intensely jealous of New York City, despite the fact that, like Barcelona, Catalonia, and Spain, New York City gives much more to the state of New York than it ever gives back, and getting anything back is like pulling teeth. It's awful. And so we had a contentious relationship. The state recognized and never hesitated to say that the city was an instrumentality. We couldn't raise our own taxes other than property taxes. Um, we did have control of land use, but there was always that specter of the yeah. state. And to be honest, um, we did a mixed job of, of dealing with the state, and sometimes for our own self-inflicted reasons, uh, sometimes uh, because they're just impossible and corrupt, by the way. I will point out that in the last, like, 10 years, 35 um, members of the legislature have been convicted at one point a couple years ago. The leader of the Assembly and the Senate had both been convicted. They've now been sort of in a little bit more legal limbo because of that McDonald, McDonald case in, right. in Virginia, which is terrible. But in any event, um, you know, we tried to avoid them as much as we possibly could. Uh, now, Congestion pricing is a really interesting example because that's one where, you know, we learned some of the lessons from our previous negative experiences, again, much of which were self-inflicted, and I take responsibility. We did everything right. Congestion pricing was a brilliant idea. The subway system was underfunded. Um, it was going to, all the money from congestion pricing, you know, where you charge a fee to come into a zone in Manhattan was going to be dedicated to mass transit, virtually all of it in the outer boroughs who might be affected. We did studies for literally every single assemblyman or senator, you know, who might be affected, showing what percentage of their constituents actually drove into Manhattan. The number was never more than 5%. The other 95%, we could demonstrate how they were going to be benefited by the new bus lines or improved subway stations. And we really literally laid out district by district every improvement went down to defeat. You know, it's the same thing that happens, for example, with gun laws after right. Newtown, you know, where 5% of the people are opposed, but they're the ones who really, you know, make noise, and the politicians don't have the courage to actually, in this case, do the right thing. The good and bad news is the problems have only escalated, and it's going to come back in some form. I mean, at some point, yeah. it's got to happen. Yeah. Um, so congestion pricing sort of um, brings up London. Um, and you, the, in the book, you talk about an early visit by then the deputy mayor of London around the sustainability agenda. So this is maybe 2005, 2006, where I don't think in most American cities people even understood what the word sustainability meant. And you took it and then moved towards really the first major climate plan. Um, plan NYC. Could you talk about that process? Because it continues to sort of reverberate. Yeah, so this was uh, 2006, actually, and a bunch of things actually converged at one point in time. 
The first was we had lost the Olympic bid to London, so I was acutely sensitive to competition with London. The second was Al Gore had kind of produced an inconvenient truce, so there was some talk about um, the c climate change. But the bigger thing for New York was, you know, I talk about growth, and if you believe in growth, then you have to be able to accommodate growth. And we were beginning to run up against constraints against growth. And they were popping up in weird, unpleasant ways. So you wanted to cite a salt pile. Um, does anybody know what a salt pile is? You know, we have to salt the roads when it snows. We actually have to find a place to store the salt. Jersey. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> We tried. Sorry to, about that. We, we, <laughs> that. That was the Brooklyn coming I, up. <laughs> I really wanted to annex part of Long Island, uh, but whatever. Um, in any event, we, no community wanted it. And we, so we, we, this was happening with tow pounds, obviously with uh, energy facilities. Just nobody wants them. And so we started looking at sort of these noxious uses and how are we going to accommodate them over time and that evolved into a more strategic land use plan at the time that sort of people were starting to talk about climate change and sustainability. And eventually what we decided to do was to step back and literally analyze every aspect of the physical environment in New York and sort of what were the constraints, what were the opportunities. And that was sort of land use, parks, brownfields, air and water, both quality and reliability, energy, transportation. And we realized, by the way, that all of those things were implicated in carbon emissions. And so we developed this plan. It took a year and a half. There were 200 people in government who worked on it. There were countless outside advisors. We had advisory boards. We included the city council in the whole planning process. And eventually we came up with this plan called Plan YC. And Plan YC was the plan for New York's physical environment over the course of the next 25 years that is said dealt on an integrated basis with every aspect of the physical environment and actually um, dealt with, because they all were interrelated, climate change. And in fact, in the seven years after um, Plan YC was announced, um, the amount of carbon emissions out of the city actually went down by about 20% as a result. So it was pretty impactful, but more importantly, it was designed to really accommodate the growth that we saw was necessary. You know, when, when we were talking the other day about who should read this book, um, you, you had said, well, you know, I hope this book sort of gets talked with, within universities and so forth. I think what comes through, and, and Antoine sort of talked about this, what, what comes through in this book is this sense of possibility and enthusiasm with governance, both within government, but also, as you just described, bringing in these other constituencies, private, civic, university, community. And the contrast with Albany or the national government could, couldn't be more stark really, where it's sort of more closed and insular and old-style legislative horse trading, where you're almost producing something that's bigger than any of the different parts, right? So could you talk about how you approached what might be considered both the hard power of managing government, but the soft power of convening all these different constituencies. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to do that. L and let me say, I think so much of this originated with Mike Bloomberg and his attitude um, about governing. Um, it's important to also recognize how unique it was as a moment in time. Not only we have sort of 9-11, this guy was elected that nobody expected, but, um, you know, Mike was elected having taken no money from anybody and therefore was beholden to no one. Um, and uh, therefore, political considerations literally never came into um, the discussion when we were trying to figure out what a policy actually ought to be. Um, he also was a guy who kind of 
said what he thought he wanted to do and then tried to go out and do it and was very clear about that. He also was terrific in terms of assembling a team and empowering people to try and really be creative. He was also a guy who never believed in holding a grudge and actually being as inclusive as possible. And that really filtered down throughout the administration. So our view was, and we got better at this over time, and sometimes early on in particular we were criticized for not being this way, but really to be very inclusive. We mentioned we rezoned 40% um, of the city. We did that in 140 separate actions. In each one, you know, we went through a rigorous, in some case, legislatively prescribed process. In some case, went way beyond it to solicit feedback, ultimately reflecting that feedback without compromising our basic ideas for kind of what ought to actually happen. Um, and so, you know, it really was, you know, so it was the ultimate in objective government, which is, yeah, you might have a hypothesis about what you want to do, but you want to include as many voices as possible and then just keep things moving. And I can't overstate how important this notion of keeping things moving really is. Um, I, I say, you know, one of the reasons it's often hard for people from business to come into government is that to be successful in government, you actually have to operate on two speeds mm. at the same time. One is you've got to be patient because there's process. You know, so many people are given a vested interest or you want to give a vested interest in the process, and that takes time. At the same time, if you don't act with a sense of urgency at all times, everything dies of its own weight. And um, we got really good at finding that balance between patience and urgency. I would point out that if you look at our federal government right now and our president, who I dealt with a fair amount as uh, <laughs> deputy mayor of New York, that notion of patience and respect for the process is ultimately sort of what he doesn't have. Right. And therefore, it makes it impossible to get things done. So um, he said, it, we got good at sort of managing that process. Well, I, I, what's a great quote also is uh, Rudy, uh, Rudy Giuliani's advice to you, which, is, which, which relates to this participatory democracy notion, which is if you put four New, York, New Yorkers in a room, you get five ideas or five views and perspectives. Um, so going through all those community planning meetings um, is the right thing to do, but at times you've got to wonder, at, you know, are we going to get to the end of this process? You well, did. And if you keep yeah, pushing yeah. it, and again, I give credit. I don't take credit for that. We had an incredible team. In the case of all those rezonings, Amanda Burton was, um, you know, just instrumental in every one. We actually had an amazing team. I mean, the ability to recruit great people into government, particularly after 9-11, was remarkable. Some of the people, you know, gone on to really do them. Sean Donovan, who... Mm -hmm. You know, ran HUD and then OMB, Jeanette Sadek Khan, across government. We had great people. But they were there because they felt empowered to get stuff done. And they felt that whether it was me or Mike Bloomberg were there to support them and push things forward. And I think as a result, you know, the, you know we got a lot, a lot done. So one last question from myself, and then we'll get questions from the audience and from the cybersphere. Um, want to move towards your current job because there's obviously been an enormous amount of focus on the Amazon competition. Um, but below the radar screening, screen, what you're doing at Google Sidewalk Labs, in particular your latest venture in Toronto, which I hope you talk about, may actually have more lessons for cities about what the future of the built environment might look like given technological innovation. So I thought you might want to talk about what you're now doing. And it, it, the conclusion of the book does talk about the role of technology, uh, the advent of driverless cars. But what you're doing in Toronto, I think, would be very important for this audience sure. to hear about. So um, we, we've, Google and I 
together formed a company. It's called Sidewalk Labs. And our mission is really to accelerate um, innovation in urban environments, but we're going about it in a uh, unusual way in that our desire is to actually build a place, be a district of a city that can demonstrate what the integration of cutting edge technology and really smart, thoughtful urbanism can actually produce. We just announced about two weeks ago that we're partnering with Toronto to do it in Toronto on what uh, is a, a remarkable site um, that's about a mile or two from downtown Toronto on the waterfront that, like New York, was sort of uh, an industrial area that saw much better days in which there's basically very little there now today. Um, and we're now going to start a one-year kind of planning process um, for... Um, exactly what that should be in consultation with the community and obviously elected officials. We have a lot of ideas which we articulated in a 200-page response mm -hmm. to an RFP that you can see online um, at our website, which is Sidewalk Toronto. But in any event, the idea here is that we think we're at one of these truly historic moments in cities where there's a technological revolution that has the capacity to affect almost every aspect of urban living. And we like to say that this is the fourth urban technology revolution in cities, or at least in, the last, in modern times. The first was around the steam engine in the early part of the 19th century. The second was around the electric grid in the later part of the 19th century. The third was the automobile um, in the early part of the 20th century, and now we think this is the fourth. And it's the digital network kind of revolution where this combination of ubiquitous connectivity, sensing, social networks, advanced computing, um, and new design and fabrication technologies really offer the promise of dramatic changes in quality of life. And we've done extensive analysis of this, feasibility studies, and we are convinced that the impact can be enormous. So we want to do it in a place in Toronto that actually then demonstrates to other cities around the world what the potential of technology is. Because getting stuff done in cities, as we've talked about, is really hard. Cities seeing other cities do interesting things Absolutely. is the best way to kind of spread the gospel. Uh, I was struck. We so we're talking about this a little bit earlier, that when we opened up the High Line in 2008, uh, to great acclaim, within a year, there were 36 High Lines under development around the world. Cities are eager, just like we were with London, to copy other cities. And the best way to get something done in many places is to see it succeed, at least in one. So watch, watch this space, because I don't think it's getting the kind of attention that obviously the Amazon competition is getting. Well, you, but, when you yeah. have a competition, yeah. um, you generate a lot of attention. We saw that in New York with the Cornell Tech thing. Sure. You know, it was Stanford versus Cornell, and that a competition generates enormous attention because it's it's a horse race and people can talk about it. And it was, we simply went out and picked what we thought was the best place in the world to do this, and that was Toronto. I've been. I've been quoted several times saying that, you know, if, if Amazon sees what we do, they'll pick Toronto. Uh, but uh, um, we're very excited about the partnership with Toronto. So questions, comments? Um, I'm just going to go right here. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Dr. Ruff. So I was, uh, my daughter and son all live in Battery Park City. Uh, it's an amazing, as you probably know, it was built from the... Uh, Landfill from the First World Trade Center site, 58,000 people live there. Um, it's enormously successful, um, and uh, it's away from all the city noise, et cetera. Why has not this been duplicated? It just seems like um, using um, that landfill um, concept. Well, in the, in the, the, the question, in case everyone in here, is Battery Park City is this, uh, this neighborhood. It's both commercial and residential. It is to the west of the World Trade Center site. It's built on landfill. 
and it's been really successful. The question is, why don't we do more of that? The answer is, compared to when this was done in the 60s and then into the early 70s, doing landfill, um, particularly in the river, uh, any river, by the way, anywhere in America, is much more difficult for environmental reasons than it was 50 years ago. And so, you know, our original plan, for example, for the Olympics, uh, and this was in kind of the late 90s, was to have the Olympic Village be in Battery Park City North, which we thought would be new landfill just to the north of Battery Park City. And we quickly abandoned the idea when we actually looked into the environmental uh, regulations. It's just too hard today. So landfill, just, you know, in Asia, you can still do it. Other places, maybe. In the United States, it's really hard. Got a question right over there. Good morning. Thanks for being here. Um, David Russell, the Local Motors. Uh, I'm actually from Michigan and Detroit, where your brother, I think, is still active, and a couple of your former colleagues I worked with at the mayor's office. Quick question. You said growth is key, prosperous. You know, the mayor is about to get reelected in Detroit, sh has struggled a little bit with growth in terms of um, equity across all neighborhoods, right? Downtown versus the neighborhood. So, uh, what advice would you give as he goes into a second term uh, in terms of growth? Because population growth hasn't come back as, as rapidly as it yeah. have in New York. And, and first of all, let me say I think Mike Duggan has done a great job in Detroit under incredibly difficult circumstances. Um, you know, Detroit actually uh, has a homecoming for people who moved away. Um, and uh, then they bring them back to show what's happening in Detroit. I actually was the keynote speaker at the first one, and you know, it was sort of what are the lessons from New York um, that um, could be applied to Detroit? I mean, everybody in America wants Detroit to succeed. Um, when I was born, by the way, there were 1.8 million people in Detroit. Uh, today, there are about 650,000, 660,000. And so it is the, this is the vicious cycle of lack of growth is Detroit. And I basically said four things, which I think are relevant today. Um, downtowns are great. Stadiums are sometimes good. Um, at the end of the day, it's, the focus always has to be on the little stuff. It has to be on the neighborhoods. And by the way, I think he's done a lot, but it hasn't yet shown significant um, impact in the neighborhoods. But you, 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 got, you have to actually um, focus on the little stuff. It's the abandoned homes. It's the street lights um, to create sort of an environment of, of kind of safety in effect and it, the second thing is it takes time. And said I, I, what I did was I related New York, not New York, but Harlem to Detroit and the experiences of Harlem. Um, and Harlem lost a massive amount of population, mostly in the 70s. It has taken 30 years to basically get it back. This stuff happened because of painstaking effort over a long period of time. Um, and so you can't be impatient. You can't set expectations that things are going to happen kind of overnight. Um, a third thing, I think, which has actually been key in some levels to Harlem's revival is diversity. Um, and, you know, um, that is a very controversial issue. Um, it brings with it fears of gentrification and changes in culture. But I think it's pretty undeniable. I think the vast majority of people would say that the changes have generally been a good thing. More services have come, you know, um, and um, that has encouraged the growth and the fill-in of vacant lots and things like that. Um, and so I think diversity is really important. Then the other thing is the city can't do it alone. Was my other lesson. Harlem had New York City. Um, you know, Detroit to a large extent, is trying to go it alone. And that's because they haven't gotten the support from the state of Michigan. Be after the bailout um, post-bankruptcy, they haven't got a lot of support really from the federal government. 
in order to revise something like that and certainly to accelerate it, you need support from other governmental entities. I will say what Dan Gilbert has done in downtown Detroit is remarkable. Um, and, um, uh, but at the end, and I know he knows this, that the success or failure will ultimately be determined in the neighborhoods. Um, and for that, by the way, the educational system is going to have to be dramatically upgraded and invested in. And thus far, that really hasn't begun to happen in a material way. Questions back over here. Yep. Dan, uh, New York is arguably the probably the world leader in business improvement districts. Uh, you didn't say anything about those, but uh, to what degree has bids impacted your work in New York, and what do you see as the future of bids? So bids, uh, for people who don't know, biz, business improvement districts are essentially almost extra governmental um, entities that are formed by the businesses in a community, and they pay, collect money, all authorized by the city, and then um, pay for services like protection, um, they pay for street cleaning, a bunch of other things. We thought they were great. Um, there were about 32 of them when we came into office already. Um, the pace of growth of them had basically ground to a halt. Uh, we brought into our government the guy who had actually run one of the most successful, had gone off to some other city, and I recruited him back with a big focus on increasing the number of bids. I think there's now over 60 of them, or says there's 70 now. Uh, so we think they're just a fabulous way, without government imposing taxes, to increase services in these commercial districts that, to my mind, are have been almost without fault. Um, and yeah, some don't work quite as well as others, but for the most part, they keep these commercial districts cleaner, safer, more lively, more interesting, and that's just a great thing. That's great. Question right over here. Hi, uh, we're visiting from Korea. I run a small foundation called Reimagining Cities, and um, I'd like to ask some of your advice or plans as to how do you apply the lessons that you've learned here to Asia? because the UN Global Status Report last year came out with data that 92 billion square meters will be built over the next 15 years, and that's building all of, well, over half of that will be in Asia, and that's building all of Manhattan maybe every month, and we don't get it right. So I'm here with LG Group, they're one of the technology partners, and they're trying to help developers build smarter and greener, and trying to figure out how do we apply that to Asia? Any advice? Well, it's, it's hard to give advice to an entire region. Um, I think in, in the book, we try and talk about some timeless lessons about, you know, kind of getting things done. And, and fundamentally, I think it boils down to four things, and there'll be a fifth one in the future. Um, one is leadership, which really can also be a catalyst um, for getting things done. In New York, it was sort of 9-11, the Olympic bid played that role. But in some cases, it was leadership basically identifying an opportunity or a problem and pushing it before it became obvious. The second is an actual philosophy. And I really do believe um, that in the vast majority of places, this notion of um, sort of you got to be prosperous to be progressive and the virtuous cycle of growth, as well as the nature of the partnership with the private sector should apply virtually everywhere. The third thing was a plan, and this is unique to every place, but being able to elevate sort of what you plan to do to a place where people can understand the context and the framework is really important, but the specifics have to be completely unique to the individual place. And the last part is creating the systems and the structures and the people to actually be able to execute on it. And in our case, key to that was the organizational structure of government, 
Um, the, and that included the people that we were actually able to recruit, which matters a great deal. Um, second was sort of storytelling, which Bruce talked a little bit about and uh, Antoine talked a little bit about, which we got really good. You know, here's, a, here's an issue, here's a solution, here's how we're going to tell it, and the way in which you tell that story is incredibly important. Um, the third is financing. Um, and every place is different, but as we talked about, mm -hmm. we got really good at being creative about finding ways to actually finance the things that we wanted to do. And whether that was the air rights for the High Line, we had a sleepy little housing finance agency um, that we leveraged much more to do our housing plan when we had no money. Um, we, you know, the air, the... Um, uh, the uh, tax increment financing district, et cetera. Finding money is so key to getting things done. So, and then I think, as I've talked about before, the fifth thing in the future is really technology and integrating it and having the skills to be able to do that. One of the things that we found most difficult in our work at Sidewalk Labs, and I think the reason the smart city movement has been a disappointment. And, you know, if you look at your own experience in Korea at Songdo, it's been a disappointment, right? It's been a disappointment urban, urbanistically as well as technologically because urbanists and technologists, the two people who have to come together to actually get anything done um, in, to make a city smarter, if you will, um, don't speak the same language. But that, I think, the way we look at cities in the next 50 years is going to be very different than the way we've looked at them in the last 50 to 100 years. Last question, Antoine, and then, and then we're going to close it out. Well, thank you. Um, you're known for a proactive rather than reactive style of government and a conceptual rather than, a, than an ad hoc style. So given that, I want to ask you what you think also, given what you're doing in Toronto, what do you think of two really powerful technological trends and how they are going to impact cities? One is the self-driving car. And the other, uh, which may be a little less obvious, is, is remote medicine. Hmm. I mean, the first has an enormous impact on employment, on garages, on roads, on, I mean, you name it, uh, public transportation. The second on what is now the biggest employer everywhere, which is healthcare. So give us your thoughts. Sure. Um, and these are two of what I think will be dozens of, of technologies that are going to fundamentally affect cities. I don't think there will be any technology that affects cities and quality of life cities more than self-driving cars. And, you know, some of this stuff I'll mention will probably be quite obvious to you, but just to give you a sense for how totally impactful self-driving cars can be as they get phased in over an extended period of time, you know, I think people probably heard the statistic, the average car in America is driven 3% of the time. In a typical American city, 30 to 40% of the land is consumed by separating roadways in order to make people safe from these dangerous things on the roads and from parking, right? So just take those couple of facts and think about the impact. When we start to have shared self-driving vehicles, um, we believe we can create a mobility system that is much more like a subscription type of system where you subscribe to a range of services, often on a shared basis. We think you can lower the cost, and we're not the only ones who have this point of view, by at least 50%. Um, of the cost of, say, owning an automobile. So for the average family in America or Canada or wherever, that cost can go down for an average family that makes maybe $60,000 by $5,000 a year. That is truly profound. So a second impact relates to the use of land. So in our modeling for this place that we're talking about in Toronto, because we think we can recapture so much land by having streets be narrower, be more intimate, by the way, much safer, um, not having to have the same level of parking, 
we can double the amount of public space in the urban environment. Okay, that doubling of public space has also very profound impacts, potentially on health, which I'll talk about in a second, um, on the amount of space people actually need um, in their apartments. By the way, when you have self-driving vehicles and the cost of mobility and storing stuff actually goes down dramatically, the amount of space you're actually going to need in your apartment or home actually goes down when your stuff that you use infrequently can be accessed much more conveniently than it is today. And so the cost of housing, we think, actually can potentially come down. There are other impacts as well. Safety, okay, when these are done right, and we're not quite there yet, but we're getting there. In an urban environment, this, the ability um, for children, for example, to walk the streets more safely will be much greater. And by the way, that will potentially be combined with things that raise issues of privacy, but monitoring of people as they, for children, let's assume, on a voluntary basis, will actually increase the level of safety for children, which, by the way, can have an impact on the educational system, which can make the community, for example, more like a classroom rather than going to one place with one teacher who's supposed to know everything in one building. We think they're really interesting opportunities there. I could literally go on about the, the second, third, fourth, fifth order impacts of... Um, of self-driving cars. Now, a big part of what happens with self-driving cars will be dependent upon how we incentivize their use. And what we don't want is we don't want a lot of unutilized or single passenger self-driving cars roaming the streets mm -hmm. because that will actually induce more traffic and that can be a negative. So there's all sorts of interesting questions there. With respect to healthcare, I don't think it's just telemedicine, but I think the nature of healthcare will actually change. We actually have launched a company. We're going to open our first clinic in New York um, early next year, probably in the second quarter of next year, that actually combines three different elements. Um, and this is going to be to care for the hardest to care for patients, typically dually eligible for Medicare and Medicaid, where the annual cost of caring for them is very high, but we think the model has broader applicability. And it's a clinically, it's a clinic-based model that combines social services um, and healthcare services, but with a caregiver, a caregiver model that um, sends specially trained caregivers who have expertise across social and healthcare services into the homes or where the patients are, and then combines that with a technological overlay, which includes most importantly sort of a data commons where the data about the patient, so they can be looked at at a 360 degree view, um, is um, possible because we know from every study that social determinants actually are a much, have a much greater impact on health than just medical issues do, or they're all interrelated. But combined with that approach, that data-driven approach, we also see telemedicine enhancing essentially the model. So we don't think it's the answer to sort of the healthcare problem. We think it's a component of an integrated solution. And you know, hopefully what we'll begin to see is dramatically better outcomes um, from this type of approach. So, so two thoughts on ending this. First of all, um, Dan is going to stick around, sign books. Um, this is not a Brookings book. So, um, you know, as, as Antoine said at the beginning, this is an important book to read. And, and frankly, my reflection on it is we don't have enough people who have served in positions like Dan has served writing it down after the fact, because I think it's really critical to reflect on what has been accomplished, what hasn't been accomplished, and what lessons that might have for other cities, whether in the United States, Korea, Europe, or elsewhere. Um, secondly, uh, we're very interested in what you have accomplished, both in writing the book, but more importantly on the ground, because we think it reflects what we call new localism. Yeah. 
power in this century belongs to the problem solvers, and problem solvers more and more congregate at the local city and metropolitan level in the government, but also private, civic, and university. Um, so everyone in the audience and in Twitter sphere um, on December 6th, we'll be hosting a session with Tom Friedman here with a co-author, Jeremy Nowak, and me of a new book called The New Localism, How Cities Can Thrive in the Age of Populism. And I, and I really think what you've written is just an incredible example of what a group of dedicated public servants, but, but thinking more broadly about the future, can accomplish in a very short period of time. And so thank you for coming to Brookings. And folks, stick around, buy the book, read the book, tweet about the book, review the book. Um, please send Dan your comments. And let, let, me, say, let me say to, to Bruce, uh, to Brookings, uh, to Ellen, to Antoine, and to all of you, uh, thank you so much for, uh, uh, for listening and having me here. It's been a real treat. Thank That's you. Great. Thank you very much.